Something I find just super tedious is manually editing text that's going to appear in a figure or a table. Why is it so tedious? Well, if you're like me, you don't just do an analysis once, you might do it five times. And so if I'm manually editing that text five times, it just gets overwhelming and it, invariably I miss something. So that's why I really like to, as much as possible, code those modifications. And so how do we code these modifications to update text and make text look pretty? <laughs> well, we'll use something that's called a regular expression. And today I'm gonna to talk about how we can do that in our R scripts for making really attractive visuals in ggplot2. Hey folks, I'm Pat Schloss and this is Code Club. Today I'm gonna to let you in on one of my pet peeves. What is that? Well, what I've been noticing in a lot of figures recently for microbiome studies is that they'll have a bacterial name um, for any taxonomic level and it's clear that they didn't know how to italicize the bacterial name because it'll be in vertical font, um, kind of a standard upright font rather than being italicized. Now, journals vary in how they handle italization of bacterial names. At the American Society for Microbiology, ASM, their journal's instruction to authors calls for all taxonomic ranks to be italicized. At the same time, sometimes we might have unclassified and then, you know, bacillus, right? And so what I'll see is that, you know, sometimes both unclassified and bacillus will be italicized or neither of them. And what's even worse <laughs> is that sometimes I'll see an underscore between unclassified and bacillus. Come on, people. Um, as we proceed to working with data for operational taxonomic units, we might also want to indicate the OTU number. And so you might want to have something like unclassified enterobacteriaceae and then in parentheses like OTU23. There's a lot of formatting that has to happen to make that all look good. And that's exactly what we're going to do in today's episode. We're going to use something called regular expressions using uh, functions from the string R package. We'll also revisit our old friend the glue package. Um, and will ease into this area of regular expressions because it's an area that I really find to be powerful. Um, it's also very confusing sometimes and very easy to screw things up, but don't worry, you won't really screw it up, but you'll, you'll just kind of have to iterate a few times before we get it right. So I'm gonna introduce you to a few of the more basic uh, things within regular expressions, and these are called quantifiers. If this all seems new to you, don't worry, I'm gonna go through it with you all. Uh, so let's head over to our studio so we can get going. So I'm going to start with this vector of OTU names. Uh, in our actual data, for the data we've been working with in the past episodes, uh, there's a few thousand uh, different OTUs. And this kind of gives us a general feel of what the different OTU names might look like um, in our data set. So again, we have OTUs. And what we'd like to do is I would like OTU001 to instead be OTU1, okay? So what I want to do is make it OTU1, OTU10, OTU100, OTU1000, and I want OTU to be in all caps, and I want there to be a space between OTU and the number, and I don't want that leading uh, zero. As I mentioned, we're going to get this to work using functions from the string R package. Uh, the string R package is part of the tidyverse, so I'll do library tidyverse. I can use str replace, and for str replace, I'll give it the string that I want to uh, match. And so let's start with OTU001, uh, maybe one more zero in there. And then we give it a pattern. And then we give it a replacement value. Okay. And so the pattern is what we want to match. And the replacement is what we want to replace that with. So um, if you've done find all, replace all in something like Microsoft Word, it's the same idea. But this is going to end up being far more powerful than what you can typically do with Microsoft Word. Um, so the pattern that I might want to use uh, to get OTU0001 to be OTU1, um, I could do, say, um, TU0001, right? Or let me remove that one. Uh, and then my replacement, I'll do TU space, and then let's see if we get it. So that outputs it as OTU1. Good, we're winning, right? All right, well, what if we had that second value in my vector of OTU0010? It doesn't do anything, right? Because it can't find this pattern in my string that I gave it. And we could do it with the other values of our vector as well. Well, you know, you could say, well, Pat, you could just rerun it with, you know, one fewer zero, 
and then you'd get O2 10 out, right? So definitely that works, um, but I don't wanna make a different regular expression for each value that I'm looking at, right? So if I come back to this original pattern that I had, something that I could put in here would be OTU and then uh, a plus sign. So a plus sign means match the preceding character, so that zero, one or more times, right? So I wanna match that zero, one, two, three, four, all the way up to whatever you want it to be, times. So now again, remember this OTU or TU zero, 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 uh, didn't match anything up here, right? And so with that plus sign, we should now get out O2.10. And sure enough, we do, right? So that works. And again, we could replace this with O2.0100, uh, zero, 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 and that works as well, right? So that plus sign again matches one or more instance of the preceding character. So if I come and do O2.1000, will this work? No, it should not work. And why shouldn't it work? Well, it shouldn't work because we're expecting the pattern to match zero one or more time, right? So we want to match that zero character one or more time, and there's no zero character after the U, right? So again, that didn't work. So what can we do in that situation? Well, there's another um, quantifier besides the plus sign that we can use, which is the star. And so the star matches the preceding character zero or more time. So the plus is one or more time, and the star is zero or more times. So that works now, right? So that's that's pretty wonderful. So let's put it all together and run str replace on our O2 vector. To use zero star, because we want to match zero or more times. And the replacement equals tu space. Ah, it was OTUs, not OTU. And so then we get the nice formatting of our four different OTU labels, right? And so I didn't have to manually go in and change those at all. So that, that was pretty nice. One other quantifier that I want to briefly show you is the question mark. And so the question mark means match the preceding character zero or one time. Where this is typically used is for things like color, right? So in US English, it's C-O-L-O-R. Whereas in say um, British English, it's C-O-L-O-U-R, right? So you could say match color with a question mark after the U and that would match both the, the US English and British English spelling of color. So if I put a question mark after the zero, that should only change, um, well, let's see what this does because I think it's gonna give us some funny results. So the results are a little bit funky. Um, and so let's look at what it did right. Uh, so the question mark again matches that zero, zero or one time. And so for O2 a thousand, it matched it zero times because there was no zero between the U and the one. And it did it for O2 zero 100 because it matched that zero one time, right? Now it did the same thing over here. It did exactly what we told it to do, but it replaced that TU zero um, with the capital TU space, right? But then it's still left in those leading zeros for OTU one and OTU 10, right? So again, what we clearly want is that star character to quantify, to match uh, that zero, zero or more times. So again, these are three quantifiers that are really powerful for telling your pattern how many times to match a preceding character and especially when you don't really know how many times we're gonna be seeing that character. So I could give this regular expression, this pattern, uh, to any number of OTUs, right? I might have 10,000 OTUs, I might have 10 OTUs, and this pattern would still work. So as we go through today's episode, try to remember these three quantifiers of the plus sign, the star, and the question mark as we go about modifying our figure from representing genus level data to OTU level data. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and work with this code that we've been working with over the past episodes. Again, if you wanna get a copy of this, I'd strongly encourage you to go to the link down below in the description where there's a blog post that's associated with today's episode. You can get this starting chunk of code so you can work along with me as I modify this code. You can then use that code to do your own experiments and then ultimately, you can take this code that we work on together and apply it to your own data uh, to really make it your own. And I would say that if you can take the code that we work with 
and apply it to your own data to get the figure you want, that is, that, that's perfect. That is exactly what I want you to be able to do because not only will you have something that's useful to you, but you will also have um, demonstrated some level of mastery of the material. And that's, that's what we want to see. All right, so in this code, we read in these libraries, we get the metadata, we get the OTU counts, um, we kind of figure out our limit of detection, we get our taxonomy information here as well, and then we're kind of joining this all together to generate um, our O2 relative abundance data. Further down in the code, we see level equals genus, and that means that we're filtering our data to only look at the genus column, the genus rows. Um, I'm gonna wanna change this to be OTU, so we'll go ahead and change level to be OTU, and this then joins all of um, our data together uh, with the taxonomy data, right? And we are um, pooling to only include those taxa that um, have a high, the maximum median relative abundance within each of the three disease status groups of greater than 1%. So if the taxa has a median relative abundance for all three groups lower than 1%, we're going to pool those together. And so again, the three disease status groups that we're looking at, uh, these data were collected from a study looking at people with and without C. difficile infections, and we're looking for biomarkers to indicate, you know, can we predict who has C. difficile? So we have people that are healthy, people with diarrhea but that don't have C. diff, and people with diarrhea who do have C. diff, okay? So we join all this together, and then this builds our nice pretty plot. Let's, um, I'm gonna change Schubert genus to Schubert OTU, and let's give this a run and see what we get. Great, so we have a figure like we've been seeing, but instead of having the taxa names on the y-axis, we have our OTU names, um, and we're gonna use those regular expressions to see if we can't clean them up and make it look better. So we'll go ahead and start by modifying these labels to be OTU space whatever, right? So remember what we did before. So we'll come back up to our code where we ran the filter function and running these two lines, we see that we have um, sample ID, disease status, relative abundance, the level, and then the taxon name as um, OTU001, right? Or O2 whatever, right? And so I think what I'll do is after that filter line, I'll do a mutate and we will do mutate and I'm going to do taxon equals and we will then say str replace and then our string will be taxon. Our pattern, and this is what we practiced at the beginning there, will be tu0 star and then replacement equals capital tu space. And be sure we got a pipe at the end there. And so now if we look at, ah, it's not happy about something. Uh, I forgot, close off the pipe. If we look at taxon relabund, we now see that we've got our nice formatting of that taxon color column. And let's go ahead and run everything else and see that our figure looks the way we want. Very good. We have our OTUs labeled, OTU space three, OTU two, and so forth without kind of that weird capitalization and those leading zeros. So good, this did exactly what I had hoped it to do. One thing I would like to do though, is back up here where we're pooling our data. Um, we're looking for things that have a medi maximum median abundance greater than one to not be pooled. Um, as we go to finer and finer taxonomic levels, um, the amount of the total data that we can represent by pooling at 1% is gonna drop. So I'm gonna reduce this to 0.5%. And so we now see that we have a few more OTUs included, but this other category is still, it's probably around 50 or 60% of the data. And so that's kind of the breaks of what happens when you have a large number of features or OTUs. Um, there's just so many ways to split the relative abundance data. So the next thing that I wanna worry about here is that we've got our OTUs, but we don't have any taxonomic names to go with them, right? Um, so I'd like to combine my taxonomy with my OTU information. All right, so I'm gonna come way back up to the top here, and I might end up revising the code we had just inserted so that we can combine both the taxonomy information with that OTU. And to remind you what taxonomy looks like is that we have an OTU, we have the kingdom phylum class family order genus, blah, 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 right? Um, and we've got 5,445 OTUs represented. What I'd like to do is create a column that goes with all this for a pretty OTU name that has both the perhaps the genus name as well as the OTU. So in here, I'll put a mutate to create a new column that I'll call pretty OTU. 
And this is going to be uh, the code that I had down below here. Um, yeah, this str replace. Uh, I'll cut that out and move that up here um, and kind of do some more cannibalizing of the code here. Uh, so we'll put that in here. And so now if I look at this, oh, what did I do wrong? Oh, I didn't want taxon, I wanted OTU. If I look at taxonomy, I now have my OTU, all my taxonomic levels, as well as the pretty OTU code. So we're in good shape. What I would like to have is my genus name and my pretty OTU merged together. So remember that down below when we make the plot, the y-axis labels is taken from the taxon column, which we actually create down further below. So I'm gonna use mutate to create a taxon column up here. And I will use the glue function, which we saw a number of episodes ago. We can do glue, and then in quotes, I'm gonna then put in curly braces, the genus column, and then in space, I'm then gonna put in round parentheses inside of that, I'm going to put pretty OTU. Um, I also need to make sure that I've loaded uh, the glue package. And let's see what this all looks like. Um, if we go ahead and run our taxonomy data frame, I'm running mutate from within mut mutate, which is not right. Uh, okay, we then get our O2, all our different taxonomic names are pretty O2, and then the taxon, which is kind of truncated. To clean up that output a little bit, I'm going to do a select with OTU and taxon. That way I'll have the pretty taxon name with the genus and the OTU label associated with the original OTU name. That way when I do my joins with things like counts and whatnot, um, that I'll be, be able to map those together. And if I look at taxonomy, I now see I've got that OTU and the cleaned up name. Now, one of the things I notice right off the bat are those blasted underscores, right? So I have enter back tracy underscore unclassified. Now in a previous episode, we did clean this up. So I wanna go back through that again because I'm spending a little bit more time in this episode talking about regular expressions. And I will add a mutate for my genus. Um, I don't need to run mutate and mutate again. For genus, um, I'm gonna do str replace. And here we're gonna uh, use as our string the genus column. And our pattern will need, and our replacement will need. And our pattern, again, it's underscore unclassified. And one of the cool things that we can do with regular expressions is that we can match different parts of a string and we can save it to memory. And so I can save things by putting the things in parentheses. And a, I'll do a character star um, and then underscore unclassified. And so what period means is match any character, right? And then the star means match that zero or more times, right? And then we've got that underscore unclassified. And what we're doing is we're saving uh, the stuff before the unclassified. And so we can then replace that with unclassified and then space, and then we can do back, back one. So backslash, backslash one means put in that stuff that was saved in that set of parentheses. And then we'll put a comma at the end of that. And so now we see we have unclassified enterobacteriaceae unclassified ruminococcaceae, and that's all good. Looking at this though, there's one more thing that I'm worried about, and that's my italization, right? So I want the Foca E. coli to be italicized, but not the OTU1. I want the enterobacteriaceae to be um, italicized, but not the unclassified. So to fix this, I think I'm gonna modify our genus mutate line um, a little bit. And so I'm gonna do genus equals str underscore replace, and then I will do string equals genus. And again, we'll need a pattern and a replacement, right? And then a comma there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the genus name and I'm gonna wrap it uh, in stars so that we can use ggtext to make it italicized. So I will then do, again, in my parentheses, period star, and we will match the whole string and I will then do star back back one star and then that will come into this next line, right? Where we'll have the underscore unclassified um, star, right? So it, it'll, it'll start and end with unclassified. And maybe I'll put star dot star uns underscore unclassified star. And the stars here are the actual characters. And so where this gets a little bit messy for patterns is that 
this is not being used as a quantifier. And so if I want to use it as the actual character, the star, I can put two backslashes in front of the star. So the back, 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 star means match the actual star. And then I can do unclassified, and I can then put star around um, the star, back, back, one, star. And now we see that we've, we got it, right? So we have our taxa name, our genus name, OTU, but our genus name is in stars. Uh, and also down here, unclassified Enterobacteriaceae, the Enterobacteriaceae is wrapped in stars, and so that's going to be italicized. And so at our OTU Relabund, let's run these two inner join statements and see what we get. So it looks like what we want. So we'll kind of continue on with the pipeline here. Here we'll go ahead and get the relative abundance data. Um, and then we get sample ID, disease status, OTU, count, taxon, and Relabund. Um, we can probably go ahead and get rid of the count column like we had here. I don't need the pivot longer because I'm already looking at the taxonomic level I want. I don't need to filter it further um, in the next step. So now if I look at OTU Relabund, great. So we have all the columns we were expecting. I'm not totally sure I need this OTU column, but I'm gonna leave it there just in case because you never know what might happen. Um, and so if we look at Taxon Relabund, um, this is where we did the filtering. I don't need that. So I can go ahead and comment this out for now. One thing I noticed that we do do for relative abundance is we multiply it by 100 to get it into percent. So I'm gonna put that 100 back up here where I calculate the relabund. And so now I've got O2 relabund, uh, which is exactly what I wanted. And here, instead of taxon relabund, I'll do O2 relabund, where we'll then, this is where we kind of figure out which OTUs to be pooling. And then here for the inner join, we have taxon relabund still, so we want OTU relabund. Ah, so we're getting a complaint about problem with mutate input taxon. False must have a class character, not class glue character. And so where was I doing something up here? Ah, so up here where I'm pooling things, um, if it was labeled as you know pool being true, then it gets the name other, otherwise it gets the name taxon. But taxon is of, of type glue, uh, not character. So what I can do is I can wrap uh, taxon in as.character. And so that way then, um, again, when it gets to these two lines, the output uh, taxon will be of type character. So this looks good. Uh, we've got our genus name or the family name that you know we're best able to classify to along with the OTU designation. Again, we got that by using STR replace as well as uh, the glue package to kind of do all the formatting and make it look pretty. One thing I'm not totally a fan of is having the other category in the middle. Um, it also doesn't seem like there's any great ordering uh, to the data here. So what I'm gonna do is maybe order it by the maximum relative abundance of that OTU in any of the three disease status groups. So to fix the order, let's come back up here. And I did have a factor reorder, FCT reorder, using the, the order by the median uh, in a descending, non-descending sort. And so I now see I have median up here and I'm using the minimum. So I think I'd rather have the max of the median. And let me look where I'm defining median up here. Um, I'm looking at the median of the medians. So here, I think what I'll do is I'll go ahead and put the max of the medians. And so now we see our O2s are ordered by uh, the maximum median relative abundance for our three disease status groups. And for those of you that haven't been watching, I realized just now that I haven't told you what we're looking at here. Uh, the ball indicates the median across um, all subjects in the study uh, for that disease status group, right? And so you can then see we have kind of a nice line um, curve <laughs> um, across our disease status groups kind of descending in terms of the median relative abundance um, for you know whatever is the largest across the three disease status groups and then we get other uh, to be positioned at the bottom so we're in good shape there so i like the ordering here um, makes me happy one thing i'm not totally a fan of is that some of these names get rather long um, and so what i might like to do is to put a break in between the genus name and the OTU label. To do that, if we come back up to wh where we had our regular expression, that right here in my glue statement, I could put in a BR. And so the BR in the angled brackets, uh, greater than less than, uh, tells ggtext um, down below here in our theme 
we had um, access text y element markdown that that then will go ahead and impose markdown or HTML formatting of our text. So it's really slick to know just a little bit of HTML uh, so that you can get the right look uh, for your figure. So that BR will put in a break, a line break uh, between the taxonomic name and the OTU. And so that looks pretty good. Uh, one thing I'm not totally a fan of is this unclassified Rumino ACA. Uh, it gets really long. And so I'm of kind of multiple opinions about this. I'm not totally sold that I need to say unclassified Rumino ACA. I think if you're talking to microbiologists that study the gut microbiome, they know that Rumino ACA is not a genus name, that it's a family name. And so unclassified ruminococcaceae isn't totally necessary, but at the same time, I also appreciate that I know a lot, right? And so maybe not everybody knows that that's unclassified ruminococcaceae. So maybe we'll leave it, but maybe so that I don't have such a long label for that one, but not everything else, I'll go ahead and put in another line break between unclassified and ruminococcaceae. And again, that was back up here where we were modifying the code. And so in this replacement, I can do unclassified break uh, and then the name of the, the genus or the family or whatever it was that was deepest classified. And so that looks a little bit tidier there on the left side with that Y axis label. Um, I could see this strategy of having uh, multiple lines per label becoming a little bit unwieldy if we had more taxa than what we have here. So again, the challenge in this episode was how do we make an attractive plot at the OTU level? As we go to finer and finer taxonomic levels, uh, the relative abundances of those levels gets finer and finer and smaller and smaller. You saw that by going down to that half percent relative abundance. Uh, you could probably go even smaller if you wanted. Um, but the challenge then of looking at OTU data was that uh, we have both OTU information like OTU1 as well as a taxonomic name. And so we need the taxonomic name because the OTU number doesn't really mean anything between studies, right? So OTU1 in my study is this bug I've never heard of before. And in your study, it might be bacillus, right? Um, the other place where it matters to have both pieces of information is because as we see here, both OTUs2 and 5 are bacteroides, right? So if I talk about OTUs2 and 5 across my study, then I want to they might behave differently, right? And so it'd be nice to know that OTUs 2 and 5 um, are both bacteroides, but they're perhaps different entities. And so their behavior, uh, their, their frequency, abundance, and distribution might vary across the study. And so I might want to talk about uh, those OTUs separately as we go through the study. In this case, it does appear that OTUs 2 and 5 kind of have the same um, relationship to each other, which, I don't know, causes me to do a little bit of head scratching. Um, but anyway... Again, that's the, the value of being able to show both the taxonomy information and the OTU information. And again, if you're doing something like Amplicon sequence variants, well, it'd be the same idea, except instead of OTU1, you might have ASV1, whatever you want to do there, right? But it's, again, the formatting and the idea of mixing different types of text together um, is the same as what we've done in this episode. So again, don't settle for underscores in your figure labels. Don't settle for... Um, vertical text when it's supposed to be italicized. Um, those, it's just not necessary, right? And so hopefully you get something out of this episode so that when you make your next relative abundance plot, you don't feel the need to keep those underscores in there or to keep things in, what is it, Roman um, or vertical uh, typeface to, to use the italization, okay? Anyway, I really hope you dig into this. Try to apply this to your own code uh, and making your own figures more attractive and more presentable and give it just that little bit more of polish. Anyway, let me know how you fare down below in the comments. Keep practicing. Be sure that you've subscribed and you've liked and you've told everyone you know about Code Club. It's really been awesome to see the growth of interest in the channel, uh, more subscriptions and views and everything. And I'm just over the moon and really happy with uh, people's positive reception. So keep practicing and we'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.